welcome to our service this morning. Uh, we basically are going to spend some time listening to music together. Um, and then uh, we are also going to share in communion, um, as is our tradition here at HIC. And then we've got David, um, uh, who will be bringing us God's word from the book of Amos. And to start it off, actually, I thought I could read uh, for you what the prophet Isaiah says. So you don't need to turn to it, but I'll be reading from Isaiah 55 and the first three verses. Uh, Isaiah says, come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy one and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread? And why labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good. And you will delight in the riches of fair. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. I don't know where you are. I don't know what your week has been like. But can I just extend Isaiah's invitation to come and to buy without money, to buy at no cost, and also not to labor in vain. This morning, we will do exactly that. We will, we, we will remind each other of the goodness of God and just how faithful God is. But more than that, actually, I, I feel that Sunday to me anyway is a time when I can get re-energized again to face the week and also just to be reminded about the key things about life. So. We shall do that together. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wanderer, come home. You're not too far. So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are. There's hope for the hopeless and all those who strayed. Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary. Rest that indoors, earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure. So lay down your Lead out. 
this week in the Tuesday night Bible study, we talked about the Lord's prayer and it's been on my mind all week because, um, I think when we sat through and read it really slowly and it, I tried to like make it seem less familiar and memorized in my mind. And it just really hit me that, um, that when Jesus taught us to pray, it was a, a plural prayer. It was, you know, um, it wasn't singular. It wasn't give me my daily bread. It was give us. And so this week, um, just, I really have been focusing on praying for the Highgate congregation as a whole. And Harry, you know, didn't know any of this, but, um, just, um, so I'm going to sort of pray with the structure of the Lord's prayer, because it has been something that's on my heart, but also incorporating some of the needs. But, um, I just wanted to point out that, um, that really has been in my heart this week that, that the Lord's prayer isn't me focused. It's us centric. So if you want to join me, that'd be great. Father, we just lift up your name. Um, we pray that it would have all honor and glory. Um, as we listen to those songs, we hear and we're reminded again of the worthiness that your name deserves, um, the way that you've lifted our burdens, the way that you offer us hope when we are so undeserving. And we just pray that that every day we would find ways to bring honor and glory to your name. We pray that your kingdom would come, that it would be active and living in Highgate and Crouch End and all over North London and all over the city of London. Um, we pray and we thank you that we get to be a part of your kingdom growing and multiplying on this earth. And we just ask that you would, um, you would continue to move your spirit in the people around us so that your name can be known um, across this nation and all the nations on the earth. We pray for our daily bread, Lord. We pray for our needs as a congregation. We pray, um, we just want to lift up those that are struggling with work. Um, I know Paula specifically, and there's others who COVID has just really hit um, on the job front. And Lord, you know that we we need we need income and we need um, we need to have jobs and work. And we just pray that your abundance and your blessing would pour into those in our group, in our midst that have that need. Um, we also lift up those who um, are really struggling with isolation. Um, I know there's several who are um, sort of more restricted and vulnerable. Um, Anne and Jean come to mind, Lord, um, who can't just get out and even have the daily walk that the rest of us get to have. And so we just pray that you would um, be very present and comfort them and um, remind them whether it's through the snow or a song or a word um, that you are there and you're present with them. Lord, we lift up Ruby, who's been in the hospital this week and um, still has some pending testing going on. And um, we just ask that you would, you would pour healing into her life and that um, as a result that your name would get such great honor that people around her would come to know you and come to love you. And we just thank you for her. We thank you for her being one of our own. We also want to lift up Carol um, and her continued recovery and Lord, just that you would um, help her body to grow and strengthen and heal um, and that she would continue to just honor you and praise you as she's done the whole time. She's been such an encouragement to all of us and we thank you for her, for her heart and her constant reassurance that God is good um, when many people would look at it and say, maybe not so. So Lord, we just thank you for her. We ask Lord that you would just as this new snow falls, that you would wipe clean all of our shame and our guilt and our sin. And um, you would help us to do that with one another, that we would look at one another every time with fresh eyes, just as you do, um, because your mercies are new. We ask that you would teach us to continue to grow like you in that way. It's in all of these, it's all these things that we pray in your beautiful and righteous son's name. Amen. What have you done? Murdered for me on that cross Accused in absence of wrong My sin washed away in your blood Too much to make sense of it all I know that you love breaks my fall
me to share um, on Friday and I had been going through a bit of a turmoil in my mind in the, the couple of days before and um, and so this is really a product of that and uh, it's, I feel a, a lot clearer in my mind I'm glad of this opportunity I'm really just sharing really from my heart. I'd like to start by reading from Hebrews 10 and verses 19 to 22. Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Mark and I are currently watching a programme on the history of the Russian Empire under the Tsars. Uh, we seem to gravitate towards rather dark programmes of despair, hopelessness, and of such that highlight the evil present in every human being. Oh my goodness, what misplaced power, what evil, what oppression, what hatred, what unfairness in the use of resources. What torture inflicted on one people group to another, despite being all of one nation and supposedly claiming to be under God's will, jurisdiction and purpose. It does beggar belief that 
the extent to which one individual will go in order to establish control over others, irrespective of who they are, including family, women and children. History is awash with the blood of the innocents. With little prompting, um, names of perpetrators may well be at the forefront of your minds and on the tip of your tongues. And so what is the answer? How is it possible for a man who is God's image barrier to be restored in order to be once again in a right relationship with his or her creator? No amount of money, no amount of education, no amount of self-help program can achieve a standard in an individual good enough to stand before the might, majesty and holiness of the one true God. I have, for much of my Christian life, struggled with the necessity of the cross in all its graphic detail as recorded in the Gospels. Over many years, I have delved into the Bible along with many associated theological books. I have had many glimpses of revelation which has opened the window a little further in understanding. I continue to search for further insight as, as it's only in such that I find a measure of peace while being constantly bombarded with the sufferings of this, our global world for which I have been brought up to believe Christ came to save. Yet in the midst of my striving, it is only as I lay them down, trusting implicitly in God's divine and all loving pl plan, do I find that peace that passes all understanding. A book I have been reading re lately is this one, The Reason for God by Timothy Keller, Belief in an Age of Skepticism. I've slowly worked my way through this book and then there's the last, the penul 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 penultimate um, chapter on the cross that really, helped me these last few days. It's taken me a little further on the journey of faith and understanding. I'd like to share with you some thoughts from the book, which has opened my eyes and heart a little more as to the necessity of the cross. A crucial point in understanding is that our Christian faith only makes sense as we fully embrace the truth that Jesus Christ is God being inexplicably in, in its in its linked with the Father along with the blessed Holy Spirit. God did not then inflict pain on someone else. The suggestion of which makes me, makes me recoil in disbelief and confusion. On the cross, God absorbed the pain, violence and evil of the world into himself. The God of the Bible is not like primitive deities who demand our blood for their wrath to be appeased. Rather, this is a God who becomes human and offers his own lifeblood in order to honor moral justice and merciful love so that one day he can destroy all evil without destroying us. The cross is not simply a lovely example of sacrificial love. Throwing your life away is not admirable. It is wrong. Jesus' death was only a good example if it was more than an example. This event, which has changed the course of history, was necessary in order to rescue us from ourselves. Justice requires that sin, including our sin, be dealt with, and paying the consequences for sin is required. There was a debt to be paid. God himself paid it. Forgiveness is always costly. Suffering is inevitable. As anyone who has been sinned against knows, both the pain of being wronged and the cost of forgiving. 
And Timothy Keller adds this, yet total forgiveness leads to a new peace, a resurrection. It is the only way to stop the spread of the evil. Human forgiveness and its costliness sheds light on divine forgiveness. And it's divine forgiveness that is the ultimate ground and resource for the redemption of humanity. Unless God gets involved in suffering, the same suffering, the same violence, oppression, grief, weakness and pain, then he is not a God of love. Only in giving himself can he do that. And the only way he could do that was via a human body, which is himself. He willingly takes his place beside those who are without power and suffering from injustice. Could we then believe in a God were it not for the cross? In the real world of pain, how can we worship a God who is, who is immune to it? Without the vehicle of the human body, God appears aloof from his subjects. The cross is the way he is able to draw near. Without the mediator being truly human, engaging with all human experiences, including death, it would appear to us to be impossible for God to draw near. God came down off his ultimate throne and suffered with the oppressed so that they might be lifted the kings and queens down through the centuries who have made attempts to identify with, with the people have understandably been the popular ones. Sadly, there have been few, but of course, it's a, something that's extremely difficult for them to do. One of the purposes of the cross is that the world's glorification of power, might and status would be exposed and defeated. On the cross, God in Christ wins through losing triumphs through defeat, achieves power through weakness and service and comes to wealth via giving all away. Jesus Christ turns the values of the world upside down. This upside down pattern so contradicts the world's thinking and practices that it creates an alternative kingdom. In this peaceable kingdom, there is a reversal of the world's values regarding power, recognition, status, and wealth. The cross of Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, was necessary to bring about justice for every precious soul on this planet. And it was part of the, and it was part of the necessary suffering involved in God being able to extend forgiveness to the same souls, each guilty of personal sin and rebellion against our creator. So let's take of the bread and the wine to simply remember why it was necessary for Jesus to suffer with us in order to suffer for us. Holy Father, we worship you for the provision you have made in Jesus so that we might be made right in your sight. We are grateful, O oh God, that we can rest on your promises and that due to this unique event, we can draw near. Just as the scripture says that we've read, our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Thank you, Father, for setting us free from ourselves by the giving of yourself. Amen. All these pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered, mended and whole, empty handed but not forsaken. I've been set free, I've been set free.
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Um, in a little while, I'm going to invite David to bring us uh, God's word from Amos. But before he does, I will read the portion he's asked me to read uh, this morning, which is coming from Amos chapter 2 and uh, verses 6 to 8. So this is what the Lord's word says, and I'm reading from the NIV. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. They sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane by holy name. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in place. In the house of their God, they drink wine taken as fine. That ends the reading of God's word, um, David. All right. Good morning, church. 
Um, I am sitting beside a window and watching the snow fall uh, and it is quite beautiful. Uh, I was talking to Harry before we started this morning and uh, I said that we don't normally get a whole lot of snow like this in North Carolina. We might get it every couple of years. Um, so it's, it's quite nice for our first winter here in London to experience uh, really nice snow like this. Um, so we're excited about that. Um, but thank you, Harry and Shirley uh, and Paula for your contributions to the service so far. Uh, it has been very good. Uh, and thank Rachel as well um, for her prayer this morning. Um, we are in the book of Amos, and as Harry uh, introduced us to last week, uh, Amos is quite an interesting prophet. Um, he is uh, he's a shepherd uh, from Tokoa. Uh, and um, in the States, there is a little town in uh, North, North Georgia, which is a very southern rural state. Um, uh, there's a town called Tokoa, spelled differently, but pronounced the same. And so when I would teach about Amos in my Old Testament classes, I would say, you know, he's from Tokoa. Uh, and so, you know, the, the students would chuckle because they would they would make that connection. Um, and it works well because Tokoa is located in the southern kingdom, which is also known as Judah. And uh, Amos has been called as a prophet to the northern kingdom, which is Israel. Uh, so really quickly, I'm going to do like a, a five minute uh, breakdown of the uh, the history of Israel, so to speak. So um, Saul was the first king, and he was the first king of what is often called the United Monarchy, which refers to when Israel and Judah are one country. Um, and then after Saul uh, comes David, and David will expand, expand the borders and make it the biggest that it will be, um, along with his son Solomon, um, who will maintain that peace through treaties and various other things, and he will um, he'll hold it together um, as, again, one united monarchy. However, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, will decide that he wants it to be a little bit more harsher for, the, for his citizens, so he um, raises taxes and, and, and various other things. And because of that, he causes a split uh, between the kingdom, where the northern part breaks away um, from his rule, and Rehoboam will remain king, but only in the southern kingdom, uh, which is then changed to Judah, and it will be made up of the tribes of Benjamin and Judah. And then the other 10 tribes will make up the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, and Jerusalem will remain in the southern kingdom uh, and become its capital, and then uh, um, the northern kingdom will, um, will have... Oh man, it just slipped out of my mind. Um, anyway, a, a different city. Um, it'll come to me and then I'll just scream it out. Um, but basically the reason that I differentiate that is because at this point, they begin to function as two separate countries. Um, so Israel will function as the Northern Kingdom and again, Judah as the Southern Kingdom. Um, and so they will... They won't be enemies necessarily, but they are not functioning as one kingdom anymore. Um, so at, at this point, it is um, that we see a couple of kings later, we get to um, uh, King Uzziah being in Judah and uh, Jeroboam is serving as king in Israel. Um, and uh, in, in verse one of Amos, it talks about this being two years before the earthquake. So setting the scene for when exactly this happens. Um, and so Amos is a farmer from the Southern Kingdom and he is called to go to the Northern Kingdom and share this message that God has for the Kingdom of Israel. Um, and Rachel and I were talking about this and it's so interesting, one, that God chooses a shepherd to be his prophet, and two, that he takes someone from the southern kingdom and places them in the northern kingdom to be his prophet. Because um, Rachel and I have recently been watching the uh, the remake of All Creatures Great and Small. Uh, when we were kids, we watched the original, 
um, you know, with uh, Peter Davison and, 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 uh, and, and whatnot. Um, so we've been watching that. And as we were talking about Amos, we're like, it's almost like if Mr. Alderson um, were to say, you know what, I'm going down to London and I am gonna get these people to listen to me and hear what I have to say and they're gonna respect me and change their ways because I, as a farmer from, even though it's the North, but it's this idea, this, this rural cultural background coming down into the um, very manufacturer-like city of London. Um, it, and it, it seems kind of ridiculous. Um, that, that God would use someone who is from such a rural background and who is a foreigner in the Northern Kingdom to be the one to call them out on what they are doing. Uh, it, it's almost this idea like, who, who are you to come into our home and tell us what we're doing wrong? Um, and so I love that. I love that God is not a God who plays by conventional rules. He doesn't feel like he has to constrict himself to just be uh, what is expected. Um, and so I, I, I just love this idea. It, it, you know, we see it all throughout scripture where, where God will flip the binary. He'll, um, he'll choose the younger son versus the older son and, uh, and, and whatnot. Um, and, it, and it's just, again, reiterating that, that God is a God for all people and not just those who are uh, in this traditional sense favored. Um, so just again, having a, having a little bit of background and helping us understand exactly what Amos's role helps us, uh, to get a picture for, for what is happening here in, uh, in chapters one and two, um, he, he opens up with verse three and he says, thus says the Lord for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. Uh, and so this is a phrase that we'll hear a number of times through these first two chapters, where God will say for three transgressions of, of Damascus, of Gaza, of Judah, of Israel, um, and even for four, I will not revoke the punishment. The idea being um, that God has, has allowed, uh, he has not taken judgment at this point, even though they have been very deserving of it. They've already messed up. A number of times, um, but God has said, you know, for three transgressions, even for four. Um, so it, it's this idea that God does not immediately just, oh, well, you made a mistake, boom, over. Um, but that there is that element of um, that of patience that that God has with us. Um, and so we we see that phrase repeated, um, and it, and it's very typical of Old Testament scriptures where we will see a phrase or an idea repeated. Um, and part of that reason was to help really score the point home, uh, to help really embed it in the listener's mind what it is that the, the author or the speaker wants to really focus on. And so here Amos is saying, you guys have messed up. Um, but what is interesting, and this is, I think, one of my favorite parts about this, this part of Amos, is he starts with Damascus, um, and then he moves on to Gaza, and then Tyre, and then Edom, and then the Ammonites, and then, and then Moab. These are all areas that are surrounding um, the northern kingdom. Um, these are some of their enemies. Um, the Edomites would have been those who were descendants of Esau. Um, so we're going all the way back to uh, the book of Genesis, Jacob and Esau, and um, Jacob being the, the chosen son who gets the blessing, uh, and then having the 12 sons who will become the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, his older brother Esau um, will become the father of the Edomites, and they will become one of those recurring enemies for the Israelites who um, are constantly biting at their heels or um, that they are having to fight for land with. Um, same with the, um, the Ammonites and the Moabites. Um, these are all enemy nations for Israel. And so it's so interesting that Amos opens up his prophecy, the words from the Lord, by speaking about the enemies of the nation of Israel. 
Uh, and so he says, for three transgressions of Damascus and even four. And he talks about, um, they've threshed Gilead. Um, I will send fire upon the house of Hazel. I'll break the, the gate bar of Damascus. Um, and, and sort of talking about what some of the punishment will be. Um, for Gaza, they carried into exile a whole people. And so for that, they will receive punishment. For Tyre, um, they again delivered a whole people uh, to Edom. Um, uh, for, and then for Edom, because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity and his anger tore petrally and he kept his wrath forever. Um, so all of these sins, all of these things that these nations have done, um, God is saying, I'm not going to remove that punishment. I'm not going to take away the judgment that is coming for them. And so for these things, as the people of Israel are hearing this message from Amos, I can only imagine, um, you know, he's on uh, a big old block in, in, in the city center and sort of um, maybe trying to get the attention and, and sort of sh uh, sharing this. Um, and so he's saying these things and the people are like, well, what's he talking about? Oh, he's talking about Damascus. Oh, God's going to punish Damascus. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Gaza. Yeah, yeah. God's going to punish Gaza. Edom. Yeah, those are our enemies. The Ammonites. Yeah, you tell them, whoever you are, some farmer from the middle of nowhere. You're right. God is going to punish those people. The Moabites. Yeah, they deserve that punishment. And then uh, in our penultimate one, we come to judgment on Judah. So starting in verse four of chapter two, it says, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have rejected the law of the Lord, have not kept its statutes, but their lies have led them astray, those after which their fathers walked. So I will send a fire upon Judah and it shall devour the strongholds of Jerusalem. Now, I think at this point, the crowd has probably gotten into a little bit of a frenzy. They're excited. Yeah, we don't really like Judah. They, we used to be the same kingdom, but then they got kind of, uh, they tried to restrict a lot of rules on us. And so we are like, no, um, you know, it, it, it's sort of like, um, you know, we're all human and we, we get that. Um, yeah, when something, somebody else is going to get that punishment. Um, you know, I just think about like when I was a kid and um you know, my little brother would get in trouble. I'd be like, yeah, that's right. You're going to get in trouble. Um, you deserve to get in trouble. You deserve it. Um, and so I, I feel like, you know, in hearing this, they're like, yeah, we agree. All of those things, th these nations, these people, they deserve that punishment that's coming to them. You tell us. But then here's the kicker. So at this point, I'm sure the crowd's super excited. They want it, they're hinging on his every word. They want to hear all the things that he's going to say about their enemies and how God's going to punish them. Punish them. So then he says in, in chapter two, verse six, he says, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. So then they're probably like, wait a minute, you, you did the old bait and switch. You're telling us about our enemies and now you're telling about us. Um, and it's so interesting because all of the other ones, they get maybe one or two verses about what they've done, uh, the sins that they've committed. But here, um, Amos will go on for nine, ten verses describing the ways that Israel have deserved their punishment. So starting verse seven uh, or um, finishing at the end of verse six, because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way of the afflicted. A man and his father go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. Yet it was I who destroyed the Ammonite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars. And it was as strong as the oaks. I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. Also, it was I who brought you up out of the land of Egypt and led you 40 years in the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. And I raised up for some of your sons to for prophets and some of your young men for Nazarites. It is indeed so, O people of Israel. Is it not indeed so, O people of Israel, declares the Lord. But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophet saying, you shall not prophesy. 
Behold, I will press you down in your place. As a cart full of sheaves presses down, flight shall perish from the swift, and the strong shall not retain his strength, nor shall the mighty save his life. Who, he who handles the bow shall not stand, and he who is swift of foot shall not save himself, nor shall he who rides the horse save his life, and he who is stout of hearing among the mighty shall flee away naked in that day, declares the Lord. But I think it's such a great strategy that Amos uses here in drawing the attention by pointing out all the faults of their neighbors, all the faults of their enemies that have come around them um, and draws them in to hear what he has to say and then says, but you guys are just as guilty as they are and you shall not escape judgment either. And it's so interesting to me what it is that Amos reports that God brings against the people of Israel. He says, because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way of the afflicted. The focus that Amos is talking about here is the fact that the people of Israel are disregarding their responsibility in taking care of those in need. The poor, the afflicted, those who are journeying in their land. This is a major, major issue for God and for the people of Israel. God has made it very clear throughout the Old Testament that the expectation is that we take care of orphans and widows, that we take care of those who are sojourning, that are journeying through our nation, and take care of those who can't take care of themselves. And so here, Amos is calling on the people of Israel and saying, this is where you guys have messed up. You have not done what God has required of you in taking care of those people. Not only that, not only have you not taken care of them, but you have purposely abused them in order to fatten your own pockets. In order to make your own wealth greater, you have trampled on the heads of those who are beneath you. And so Amos here is drawing attention to the fact that Israel has messed up in dealing with those elements of what is often referred to as social justice. Social justice has become a very hot topic recently, um, particularly as we've seen in recent years in the United States with the the rise of movements such as uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, this idea that the people in power are oppressing those who do not have the majority or do not have the power or do not have the influence. And so here Amos is calling on the people of Israel and saying, this is what you've done. You've used your power, your influence, your majority to take advantage of those that are less fortunate than you. Those that don't have the money and the resources that you do, you have taxed them even more. And for God, a God who is a God of justice, this is too much. So he speaks out against Israel and tells them, that this is the reason that they will be punished because they have not taken care of their fellow man. So what does this mean for us? As we're reading this passage, as we're reading this scripture thousands of years after this has happened, after we've seen the punishment that did happen for Israel in being taken away by the Assyrian nation and scattered and lost forever, what does that mean for us living in 21st century London? I think what's most important for us to take away from this passage is the fact that we, 
as followers of Christ, as those who believe that he is the way, that we take the time, that we are intentional in sharing with those that are less fortunate than us, that we don't take advantage of those who don't have, that we don't merely walk by when we see someone in need. Because God is a God who cares for everyone. And he is the God who sees them. I think it's no coincidence that when Jesus talks about the people that will be with him in his kingdom, he describes people who clothed him when he was naked, who visited him when he was in prison, who came to him and gave him food when he was sick. I think that this is the exact message that the Israelites were missing. That God is a God who cares for those people that are in need. And it's our responsibility, those of us that have what we need, to share what we have with those that don't. If you have two coats, give one to someone who doesn't. And so this is why Amos has been called to the kingdom of Israel. Because this is a most egregious sin. This is a sin that hits at the very heart of who God is. It's not something that God can ignore. And so I want to encourage us, as we are going about our daily lives, to find ways to be the voice for the voiceless, to provide for those who can't provide for themselves. I'm encouraged in having conversations with many of you and the things that we are doing as a church, as individuals, as a community. I'm encouraged to hear the things that we're doing in reaching out to those in need around us. And I think that that is one of the greatest testaments for us as followers of Christ. Jesus tells us, how will they know that we are his followers? They will know we are his disciples by our love. And that's what the people of Israel were missing. They weren't demonstrating that love to their neighbor. They weren't taking care of their fellow man. They were so focused on their own needs and their own desires to become more powerful and to become stronger and to have more. That they let the needs of those people fall to the wayside. So as we look at this scripture, I'm reminded of what Harry said last week in talking about Amos and introducing us to him, how there is hope in Amos. As we look at these chapters, there's not a whole lot of hope. We see a lot of judgment. We see a lot of punishment coming. But I do want to encourage you that there is hope as we continue through the book of Amos. But that hope doesn't come without an expectation. God says, for those sins, for those transgressions, there will be punishment. But there is a chance to be able to be free from that punishment in turning away from what we're doing, in turning away from the mistakes that the people of Israel have made, and turning to God and doing what God has called them to do. That is the hope that we have in knowing that we are no longer bound to punishment. Because when we have turned our lives to Jesus, when we have made that commitment, that forgiveness that he secured for us on the cross, 
now covers all of our sins. And all that he asks us to do is to follow him and to go and share with the world what he has done for us. What an amazing hope we have. Knowing that we are far worse than what is listed here as the transgressions of the people of Israel. We have done terrible, horrible things. We are but filthy rags. Yet because of God's great love for us, he sent his son to pay a punishment that we could never afford. To free us from chains that we could never break. We are guilty. Just as the people of Israel are guilty. But our hope is not built on our being guilt free. Our hope is built on the forgiveness that we have through Jesus Christ. Knowing that he has paid that price. Knowing that our salvation is assured because of his love and sacrifice on the cross. If you this morning are struggling with guilt or struggling with an overwhelming sense of hopelessness, I want to encourage you this morning. Remind you that we are no longer seen as guilty. That as the Lord looks through us, he sees us through the lens of Jesus Christ. And we are seen as even wider than that snow that is outside right now. not because of anything we've done, in spite of everything that we've done, because of what Jesus did in coming to this earth to live as a human, to bear our sins, to die on the cross and rise from the dead, declaring victory once and for all over sin and death. We have hope knowing that because of his actions, we will spend eternity with him. Please do not live in guilt anymore. Seek that forgiveness for your missteps and cast them on the Lord knowing that he has carried all of your sins and he has removed them. Keep that hope and that focus on him, knowing that the love that he has for us is inexhaustible and that he has chosen us. And in sending his son, he welcomes us to be with him in his kingdom forever. We are no longer guilty. Our transgressions do not define us. Let us go out and share that message that others might experience that freedom as well. That they might come to know who Jesus is and be free from their sin, from their chains, from their oppression. Let us be his hands and feet here on the earth.